the rhinoceros bones revealed even more. The scratch marks were beneath and therefore made earlier than tooth marks made by other predators. So Boxgrove man must have got to the carcass first. So there's a lot of people um, around the carcass doing things, chopping it up, defleshing it, splitting the bones to extract the marrow, and there doesn't seem to be anything in that process that suggests haste. It's all very methodically done. Um, that implies to me that, that they actually didn't have any problem securing carcasses within the landscape from other major predators. And what would have been the main threats around in the area at the time? We've got a leopard, lions and hyenas. So and if Boxgrove man had got first pickings, could that imply that he had also hunted and killed the animal? It's a question that divides paleontologists. The view maybe 20 years ago was that these people were probably capable big game hunters. And then uh, within the last 10 years, the pendulum swung the other way to the view that, in fact, no, they were probably lousy hunters and maybe they could catch a, something the size of a rabbit now and again. But otherwise, they were mainly scavenging. They were having to get secondary access to the kills of other carnivores. Um, so they were not capable hunters. And now, of course, um, sites like Boxgrove are, are giving us new data that's kind of opening up the whole debate again. It was Britain's leading forensic pathologist, Bernard Knight, who resolved the debate. When he was shown a find from the Boxgrove site, the shoulder blade of a horse, he discovered incriminating evidence. I'm often asked to look at bones and pictures of bones. Um, I must admit at first, I wasn't all that impressed, though there was this very regular, almost semicircular defect in the edge. Then I went up to the Natural History Museum and looked at the actual bone. And I must say, uh, my uh, scepticism was reversed quite remarkably. First of all, there was this quite impressive, I suppose a third, or almost half a circle cut out very regularly. But the main thing was, if you looked end on at the defect, and it, if that's the top of the bone, there's the outside facing the outside world, so to speak, there was at the edge of this defect a cliff and then a chamfered, tapered off edge there. And this is the important part, because if that's the other edge of it, if an impact comes that way, the top edge is cleanly cut. There's a clean hole there, but as this is not supported, a piece of bone breaks off and that you get this terraced effect uh, on each edge. You see this in bullet wounds through bones or any moderately high speed impact. And that to me is absolute proof that this must have been something going fairly fast and hitting one side and going through to the other. Could it have been a spear hurled by Boxgrove man, the hunter? Right, so that's it then. So one horse scapula and we're set up. And if we just bring that down and make sure that we're actually in. Yeah. Okay, so the archaeologists turn to Bernard Knight's forensic laboratory to find out. This machine mimics the effects of projectiles, in this case, a wooden spear. It's just a matter of seeing whether it's actually going to go through. Moment of truth. Ah! <laughs> That's a very neat little hole. It is. It's an excellent start to the experiments. We've shown that, that the spear tip's going to go through, and it looks as though we will be able to almost exactly replicate the wound that we found on the original Boxgrove scapula. 